evening, Facebook family. Welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, we're going to get into the Word of God. If you have your Bibles with you, we'll turn to Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 to 32. I believe that there's a word from the Lord for us tonight. And so the title of tonight's lesson is Tired of the Me I See. And so we'll take a minute and just pray with me. Father, I thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to stand behind your sacred desk and to teach your word to your people. I pray now, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would hide me behind the cross so that they don't see me or hear me, but that they see you, hear you, and respond to you. Father, you are the faithful God that has called me. You said you also would do it. I pray that you would do it now, God, for your glory and for your holy name's sake and for the advancement of your great kingdom. I pray, Father God, that your word will fall on good ground tonight and that it will produce fruit for you, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold, and you will use this word tonight to transform the lives of your people that we might be the men and women of God that you called and ordained for us to be. I thank you in advance for what you're going to do. You are so faithful. You are so kind. Walk heavy in this place and in every house, Father God, of those who are tuning in. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis 32, verses 22 to 32, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It's a pretty well-known um, passage of scripture, but I believe that the Lord wants to speak to us um, through it tonight. And so it reads, During the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two servant wives, and his eleven sons and crossed the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. This left Jacob all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Then the man said, Let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men, men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name, the man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. The sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel, and he was limping because of the injury to his hip. Even today, the people of Israel don't eat the tendon near the hip socket because of what happened that night when the man strained the tendon of Jacob's hip. I also want to read, um, before we get into the lesson tonight, Hosea chapter 12, verses 3 to 5. Hosea 12, 3 to 5 from the NIV reads, In the womb he grasped his brother's heel, and as a man he struggled with God. He struggled with the angel and overcame him. He wept and begged for his favor. He found him at Bethel and talked with him there. The Lord God Almighty, the Lord is his name. And so many of you Bible readers know the story of Jacob and Esau, but I want to recap some of um, the major points in Jacob's life. And I want to talk about his name. I want to talk about what it means so that we really understand what's going on in the text. When I say tired of the need that I see, I believe that Jacob had gotten to a point and his walk with God and his relationship with God, where he was tired of the me that he saw. He was tired, and he needed God to change him. He needed God to touch him. He needed God to bless him. I think this is an interesting word tonight, um, because I believe that this is a word that um, lends itself a little more to the mature believer. I believe that this word tonight is an answer to some of you who have been praying about your own walk with God. It may seem on the surface that it's for, you know, the recently saved believer, the babe in Christ, or the carnal Christian. And of course, the word is the word, so it's for everybody, and it blesses everybody. But I believe that this word is for those who have been walking with God and have a relationship with God, and God has a specific answer for some of you who have been praying. So here we have Jacob, right? He's a man of God, and here's what we have to know. Jacob had a prayer life. Jacob was a man of God. At this time of our text, he has had multiple encounters with God. He has a relationship with God. This is not like a Damascus Road experience the way Paul had in Acts, where he was converted um, into Christianity, where he was not saved and he became saved. This encounter that we're going to talk about is after Jacob already has a relationship with the Lord. In Genesis chapter 8, or 28, I'm going to read a little bit of it a little bit later, he already... Um, 
saw the staircase to heaven, the angels ascending and descending on that stairway to heaven. And so he has this relationship. God has spoken to him on different occasions. And so that's part of the reason why I believe that this word is for the mature or the maturing believer, because we find Jacob tired of the me that he sees when he is in the middle of his relationship with God. He didn't just start walking with God. And so I want to talk a little bit about Jacob's name for a second. And so in Genesis 25, verses 24 to 26, it says, And when the time came to give birth, Rebekah discovered that she indeed had twins. The first one was very red at birth and covered with thick hair like a fur coat, so they named him Esau. Then the other twin was born, and his hand was grasping at Esau's heel, so they named him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when the twins were born. And so Esau was born first, but when Esau was born, Jacob was grasping at the heel of Esau, and so they named him Jacob, which means trickster or supplanter. And so a supplanter, which is how his name can be translated in the Hebrew, means to take the place of another as through force, scheming, strategy, or the like. So Jacob was a trickster. And not only is that what his name meant, and they named that because he was grabbing on the heel of his brother even from birth, but his whole life, and we're going to take a look at a couple different instances, his whole life is just kind of who he was. You know, pre-salvation, post-salvation. You know, before he got to know God, after he got to know God. This is just kind of who he was and how he was defined. And I feel like that's going to be very important for us to remember going forward. Um, you Bible readers, and, and I, I taught this text, um, I don't know, maybe about a year ago, in Genesis chapter 25, verses 29 to 34. Um, and that is the text where, let me, as a matter of fact, let me read it. It says, um, and I believe when I taught this particular text, we were dealing with the pain of discipline versus the pain of regret. Um, Genesis 25, 29 to 34. It says, one day when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of this red stew. And this is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. All right, Jacob replied, but trade me your rights as your firstborn, as the firstborn son. Look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. What good is my birthright to me now? But Jacob said, first you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby by selling all his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew, and Esau ate the meal and then got up and left, and he showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. And so before, when I dealt just exclusively with this text, I talked about Esau, we talked about the pain of discipline. He didn't have the discipline just to wait for a meal versus the pain of regret. And he ended up um, having so much regret for selling something as valuable as his birthright for something as small as a single meal. But I, want, I, I read it briefly um, tonight because I want to talk about Jacob. Like his brother, this is his brother, you know, they're, you know, twins. And Esau came in and he was really hungry and Jacob being the trickster or the supplanter that he is saw an opportunity. So instead of being kind, instead of being loving, instead of being generous, instead of helping his brother and just giving him something to eat, which essentially would have cost him nothing, he found an opportunity to take advantage of his brother's hunger and, and make it work for himself. And I want I wanted to read that because I want to kind of paint a picture. Some of you Bible readers are already familiar with these passages of scriptures that I'm referring to now. But even if you aren't, I just want to paint a picture of Jacob's personality. I want to paint a picture of the fact that he indeed was a trickster. He indeed um, was a supplanter. And so even this dialogue that he had with Esau, I mean, Esau, the Bible says, showed contempt for his birthright. But the fact that that was even on Jacob's mind. Like Esau wanted something to eat, and it was on Jacob's mind to see what he could get from him. And he knew that what he was getting from him, that he was manipulating him and taking advantage of his hunger, and what he was receiving in return for a bowl of stew was so much more than that bowl of stew was worth. And then in Genesis 27, I'm going to read some of that. Genesis 27, verses 18 to 27, and then verses 30 to 36. And this story, I don't know if I'm going to read it all, but you can read it when you get a chance. Genesis 27, 18 to 27, and 30 to 36. This is when Jacob deceived his father and, you know, stole the birthright, went and got the blessing 
from his father and pretended to be Esau. And it's interesting, as a matter of fact, I do want to read it because, um, and, and I'm starting at verse 18, but I really want you to go back and start Genesis 27 at verse 1, especially if you're not familiar with this story, because I want to suggest to you that Rebecca was also tricky. You know, her brother Laban was also tricky. Um, we talked about, when, when I talked on battles in the bloodline, I talked about the things that run in families. And usually, so if Jacob was a trickster, he got it from somewhere. And the truth is, his mother was a trickster, too. And his uncle was a trickster, too. Whatever you are, you, you probably, other people in your family, probably the same thing because we have these battles in our bloodline. And so even this opportunity for him to um, trick his father was his mother's idea. But I'm going to start reading at verse 18. It says, so Jacob took the food to his father. It says his mother prepared it. She did all of that. Told him, don't worry, trust me, do everything I say. So Jacob took the food to his father. My father, he said, yes, my son, Isaac answered. Who are you, Esau or Jacob? And Jacob replied, it's Esau, your firstborn son. Because at this point, Isaac was old and he could no longer see. And so he asked, are you Jacob or Esau? And Jacob said, I'm Esau. I, you know, so he's deceiving. I'm Esau, your firstborn son. I've done as you told me. Here's your wild game. Now sit up and eat it so you can give me your blessing. And Isaac asked, how did you find it so quickly, my son? Because um, Isaac had told him to go out, kill something, prepare it, and bring it back for me. And he's like, you got back fast. And so he said, listen to his answer. Because he said, how did you get back? So quickly, my son, the Lord your God put it in my path. He done brought the Lord into his life. The Lord your God put it in my path, Jacob replied. Then Isaac said to Jacob, come closer so I can touch you and make sure that you are really Esau. So Jacob went closer to his father and he, Isaac touched him. The voice is Jacob's, but the hands are Esau's, Isaac said. Because he was blind, but he had his other senses, and he didn't believe that it was Esau because it sounded like Jacob, even though Jacob said, no, it's Esau. And he touched him, and he said the hands are like Esau's because his mother, who helped him, you know, trick his father, had put goat hair on his neck and on his hands because Esau was so um, hairy. And so I'm going to jump down to verse 26. Then Isaac said to Jacob, please come a little closer and kiss me, my son. So Jacob went over and kissed him, and when Isaac caught a smell of his clothes, he was finally convinced and blessed his son. And so his mother had thought of, pre-thought of everything. So she put the goat's hair on his skin so he would be hairy like Esau, and Jacob had on Esau's clothes so that he would smell like Esau because it was difficult to trick his father. He was tricking Isaac because he's a trickster, and he knew that his, he couldn't make his voice sound different than it did, and so his voice sounded the same, but then he smelled them, and so he was finally able, his father was finally convinced, he was finally deceived, and believed that it was actually, um, that it was actually Esau, even though it was Jacob. So let me jump down to verse 30. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, almost before Jacob had left his father, Esau returned from his hunt. Esau prepared a delicious meal. He did everything that his father told him to do. You know, and then he said, sit up so you can eat. And then Isaac was like, what? Verse 32, but Isaac asked him, who are you? And Esau replied, it's your son, your firstborn son Esau. Isaac began to tremble uncontrollably and said, then who just served me wild game? I've already eaten it, and I blessed him just before you came. And yes, my blessing must stand. When Esau heard his father's words, he let out a loud and bitter cry. Oh, my father, what about me? Bless me too, he begged. But Isaac said, your brother was here and he tricked me. Your brother was here and he tricked me. He has taken away your blessing. Listen to verse 36. Esau exclaimed, no wonder his name is Jacob. For now he has cheated me twice. First he took my rights as the firstborn son, and now he has stolen my blessing. Oh, haven't you saved even one blessing for me? And then you can finish reading. And I'm just reading this because it is important. When we talk about how um, God changed him in our text um, tonight, God changed Jacob from Jacob to Israel. And even though it seems on the surface, we're going to get into it, that he just changed his name, but it wasn't, it was, he was changing who he was. And we see that throughout his life, this was characteristic of him. 
tricking, lying, deceiving, scheming, manipulating was characteristic of Jacob. It was who he was. And so Genesis, let me read just a little bit more. Genesis 28, verses 12 to 22, um, it says, As he slept, he dreamt of a stairway that reached from, from the earth up to heaven, and he saw the angels of God going up and down on the stairway. At the top of the stairway stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham, the God of your father Isaac, the ground you are lying on belongs to you. I'm giving it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will spread out in all directions, to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. Verse 15, what's more? I'm with you, and I will protect you wherever you go. One day I'll bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have finished giving you everything I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I wasn't even aware of it. And he was also afraid and said, What an awesome place this is. It is none other than the house of God, the very gateway to heaven. And I read that because this is Jacob. This is the trickster, the manipulator, the supplanter. This is the liar, the deceiver. The one who, you know, lied to his father, schemed with his mother, tricked his brother. But I am telling you that God spoke to him, that God revealed himself to him, that he had a relationship. And it is important to know that you can be all messed up and be saved and have a relationship with God. And so I'm spending this time painting this picture so that we understand when we get to our text, as a matter of fact, where Jacob was in his walk with God. Let me read one more, and then we'll get into um, tonight's text just to give you a little bit more backdrop on Jacob his and his life and his background and who he was as a man in his relationship with God. Genesis 31, verses 5 to 7, and verses 10 to 13. He said to them, I've noticed your father's attitude towards me has changed. Now this is him. This is later on. He's married to um, Rachel and Leah, and he's talking to them about um, their father Laban and how his attitude toward him had changed. It says, but the God of my father has been with me. And I emphasize this and I read this because we have to understand that God was with him and he knew God was with him. I'm going to jump down to verse 11, Genesis 30. 111. It says, then in my dream, the angel of God said to me, Jacob, and I replied, yes, here I am. The angel said, look up and you will see that the only streaked, speckled, and spotted males are mating with the females of your flock. For I have seen how Laban has treated you. I am the God who appeared to you at Bethel, chapter 28 that I just read, the place where you anointed the pillar of stone and made your vow to me. Now get ready to leave this country and return to the land of your birth. So God's speaking to him again, and, I, and I'm spending this time because it's so important. I cannot overemphasize the importance of us understanding that Jacob had a relationship with God. It was not because he didn't have a relationship with God. It wasn't that he wasn't saved, that he was a trickster. Sometimes we are who we are, and we need God to change us, and we can love God and still be all messed up. And so in several instances, I wanted to show you that this was not his first encounter with God, that Jacob prayed, that God answered, that God spoke to him, that God revealed himself to him, that God was with him, that God blessed him. And even when Laban mistreated him, God acknowledged that I have seen the way Laban has treated you. And so all of that is really important. So as we get into our text, um, what our text is about is Jacob... You know, in, in chapter 32, when I started reading in our text, our, our main text is verse 22 to 32, but in the beginning of Genesis chapter 32, because at the end of chapter 31, God told him to return to the land of your birth, and he was afraid of returning to the land of his birth because of Esau, because Esau wanted to kill him. Esau had vowed to kill him because he was so angry because of what Jacob had done, and so he, you know, he sends gifts and messengers ahead of him for Esau hoping and praying that it would make Esau receive him, you know, in a friendly, welcoming way and not try to kill him. And then word had gotten back that Esau had already heard that Jacob was on his way and Esau was coming to meet him with like 400 men and Jacob was scared to death. And so he sent, you know, he sent his uh, other wives over and then he sent Leah and her kids over and then last he sent Rachel and her kids over and in our text we find him alone with God but here it's important that we understand 
that Jacob's life had caught up with him. That the way he was, him being a liar, a deceiver, a trickster, that we reap what we sow. And he had gotten to a place that it had caught up with him. Like what he was going through and his life and his circumstances were a result of the life that he had lived. And, and I want... And I'm emphasizing this because you can be saved and you can love God, you can have a relationship with God, and you can pray and your life still be the things that you face and some of the situations and circumstances you go through, some of the fears that you have can be as a result of the life that you have lived. And so maybe you're not exactly like Jacob. You know, maybe you're not a trickster, but you have something. So here, Jacob, in our text, Jacob wrestles with God because he was tired of the me that he saw. And I want to ask you tonight, are you tired of the me that you see? You know, when no one else is around, when no one else is looking, and it's just you and your thoughts in, a, in the mirror, and you're looking at yourself, and you know you. I'm not talking about the you that you post on social media. I'm not talking about the you that you present yourself as in church or among your friends or your coworkers. I'm talking about the you that you see, the me that I see. When I look in the mirror, Jacob had gotten tired. I want to suggest that our text is about wrestling with God because he got tired of the me that I see. And so maybe you're not a trickster. Maybe you're just mean or defensive or jealous or conniving or envious or hateful. Maybe you're paranoid all the time. Maybe you think everyone hates you and everybody's talking about you and you're just paranoid all the time. Maybe you're distrustful. Maybe that's your thing. It doesn't matter who they are or how you met or how long you've known them. You don't trust anybody ever and you don't know how to be different. That's just the way you are. That's the way you've always been. You know, Jacob, a big part of why Jacob was the trickster he was is because his mother, Rebecca, was the trickster she was. He got it on us. It was a battle in his bloodline, but it was still something that he had to fight. Maybe you're always angry. Maybe it's your temper, um, being easily angered, losing your temper, having fits of rage that are your thing. Maybe you're unforgiving. Maybe you hold grudges and you just can't seem to forgive people. Maybe you're overly sensitive or easily offended. And I'm just I'm just going down the list because until I find you, I'm coming, I'm coming to your house, I'm coming to your living room, and, I, and this word is going to find you because all of us have something. And even though we're saved and even though we love God, there's sometimes we get tired of the me we see because I, I want to be different and I know I need to be different and I know I need to change. Last week I taught on love and we talked about the family resemblance and how we have to learn to love the way God loved. And when people look at us, they ought to see the love of Christ. There ought to be at, at this point in your walk with God. At this point, you've been saved so long now. Here comes a point in our walk with God where I can be more like God, but I have this thing that I, I've always been this way and I know I need to be different, but if it was that simple, if I could just be different, I would be different. Sometimes you know you need to change, but if change was that easy, I'd have done it a long time ago. And so I'm just asking, maybe you're insecure. Maybe you are always so insecure. It doesn't even matter how much the people who love you affirm you, you can't seem to shake the insecurity that you feel. Maybe you're argumentative or prideful. Maybe you're selfish and self-centered and everything is about you. When I was on your street last week when I talked about love and how love is not self-seeking and you know that every decision you make, big ones and little ones, is always centered around you because you're selfish and self-centered. Maybe you're impatient or unkind. Maybe you're promiscuous. Maybe you always feel empty or you are in a continual battle with depression. You're always down. You're always sad and you continually battle it. Maybe you're moody. Maybe your mood swings swing like a pendulum and the people in your family, all they can do is try to stay out your way. I'm just, I'm just trying to find you because all of it, maybe your problem, maybe your issue is a habit that you can't kick or an addiction that you're trying to hide. I am just saying that it is something when no one's around and it's just you, you know, we're not even in church, you at home, I'm at home, or you in your car, wherever you are, and so we got turned to our neighbor and nothing like that, but when it's just you, and it's just your thoughts, and you, it's, you're looking at yourself, and you know, I'm tired of the me that I see, you can get to a point, and the reason, even in the very beginning when I talked about how this is for the mature or the maturing believer, 
is because I want to suggest to you that if you get to the place where you are tired of the me that I see, where you get sick and tired of yourself, that is an indication that you have grown spiritually. What do I mean? I mean you always been you, right? You've always been the way you are. I'm going to use Jacob as an example. Jacob was always a trickster. When he was born, he was grabbing at the heel of his brother before he even came out the womb. They were fighting in the womb, the scripture says. I didn't read all that, but in Genesis 25, you know, Rebecca had to pray because the twins was fighting in the womb. And so he's always been that way. And the way you are, part of the reason why you struggle, part of the reason why you're tired of the me that you see and that you don't know how to be different is because you've always been this way. Like you've always been selfish or you've always been insecure or you've always been snarky, mean or sarcastic or whatever your it is, whatever your struggle is, whatever your, your sin is, whatever it is, you've always been that way. And so Jacob has always been that way. And as we grow spiritually, we grow to the place where we're tired of the me that we see. Because there was a time in your walk with God before you got saved and even after you got saved where you're like, well, that's just the way I am. Well, people can just accept me or they ain't got to accept me. God know my part. That's just the way I am. And then we would justify it as if this just being the way that we are. But as we grow, child of God, as we get closer to God, as we read and study and meditate on his word, and the closer we get to God, the more we become tired of the me we see because we want to be more like God than we are. You know, the Bible says that God is light in 1 John, 1 John chapter 1. It says God is light and in him is no darkness at all. As a matter of fact, let me turn to it. I think it's verse 5, but I'm going to find it for you. First John, that's the John that's in the back of the Bible. Um, it's John 1, 2, and 3, and I'm turning to the first one, chapter 1. First John, chapter 1, verse 5. It says, this is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. God is light. And there is no darkness in him at all. Last week we talked about how God is love. He loves because he is love. God is light. And there is no darkness in him at all. And so I read that scripture to tell us that God is light. Because the closer we get to God, the closer we get to the light. And the brighter his light shines on our life. And so if my house is dirty and dusty, but I keep the, the lights dim, then you can't see how dusty my table is. You can't see how dusty my furniture is. But the brighter the light becomes, the more I turn up the light. If I switch from a 40 watt to a 60 watt, or if I switch from a 60 watt to a 100 watt um, light bulb, then the dirt was always there. But the brighter the light, the easier it is to see the dirt. And I want to suggest to you, because sometimes the devil will fight us and make us feel that we are very unspiritual or that, you know, I ain't never going to be right. I can't believe this much is still wrong with me. But what's happening, child of God, first of all, all this always been wrong with you. But you are growing. But the reason you feel the way you feel, the reason you're tired of the me that you see is because you are getting closer to God, and so you see your dirt more clearly. You see what's wrong with you more clearly because God is light, and everywhere he is, he shines on all things, and there's no darkness in him at all, so every dark place, every dirty place in me shows up so bright the closer I get to the Lord. And so even as we talk tonight, I don't want you to be discouraged. I want you to be encouraged. If you are, that's why I felt like I was so on assignment tonight because I feel, I believe just from the way the Holy Spirit has been speaking to me and leading me is that some of you have been praying because the enemy has been fighting you and even making you down or depressed or sad because you feel like you're trying to grow, you're reading more than you've ever read, you're praying more than you've ever prayed, you're becoming consistent in your devotional life, and it seems like the more you read, not only are the more you are fought by the enemy, but it seems like the more messed up you feel. But you've always been that messed up. God is just shining the light on it so that he can change us. So let's get into our text so we have time to really just go through it and exegete the whole thing. So 
the question is what's making you tired of the me that I see? Like, when, what's making you tired of you? Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Or a better question might be, are you tired enough yet of the me that you see? Are you ready to wrestle with God until he changes you? Are you re ready yet, like Jacob, to say, look, Lord, change me or kill me, but I can't keep living like this. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. All right, so let's take a look at our text. Let's go back to our text for tonight. That's enough background on Jacob. So um, starting at verse 22 again, it says, During the night Jacob got up, took his two wives, his two servant wives, and his 11 sons, and crossed the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over his possessions. Listen to verse 24. This left Jacob all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. And the first thing I want to point out is God is coming to you. You know, it says the man, calls him the man, but Hosea, I read Hosea 12, 3 to 5, but it lets us know because it says that as a man, he struggled with God. So it was the angel of the Lord or a theophonic manifestation of God. He wrestled with God. And so the text calls it a man, but I need you to know that we know that he literally wrestled with God because of Hosea tells us that that man that he wrestled with was God. And so God is coming to you the same way God came to Jacob. In verse 24, it says, this left Jacob all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him. He will show up. He has shown up. I want to suggest to you that even this Bible study lesson tonight is God showing up. You've been talking to him, and you've been praying, and he wants to know how badly you want to be different, how badly you want to be changed. Are you ready to wrestle with God? He has shown up saying that I hear your prayer, and I hear what you're asking me. And I will do what I, I'm here. I'm here to wrestle with you. I'm here to change you. And so God is coming to you and he's here. He's answering your prayers. You've been honest and you've been transparent with God about where you are. You have owned and acknowledged where you are. You have expressed the desire to grow and be more like him. You want to be different. You want to love like he loves. And when people look at you, you want there to be some family resemblance. And so God is coming to you. But the same verse, and the next thing that we have to see is God has to get you alone. God came to Jacob, but God didn't come to Jacob until Jacob was alone. Verse 24, again, this left Jacob all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. And, you know, Bible study is great. I'm so glad you tune in. I pray that you tune in to um, Sunday service on Sunday morning while we are, you know, in this pandemic. If you have family devotions, family devotions is of God. It is biblical. I'm glad that you have family devotions. I think that's spectacular. But this work that I'm talking about, this changing of you on the inside, the way you've always been, that thing that's making you tired of the me that I see, that's a long time with God work. That's a long time with God. You're going to have to go in your secret closet. You're going to have to um, close the door. And you're going to have to be alone with God for this wrestling. This is not going to be a social media post. This is not going to be a group thread. This is not going to be something that you share. This is something. There has to be a time when we get alone with God. Part of the reason is if you are praying, and don't get me wrong, I got prayer partners. I hope you got prayer partners. I hope you have family devotion. You know, the Bible teaches us in Matthew 18 where two or three are gathered together in his name that he is in the midst where two or three of us come together um, touching anything on earth he'll do it in heaven. Those are the words of Jesus. I know that there's power in agreement. I taught about the power of agreement. But I am saying for this wrestling match, I'm talking about changing. I'm talking about if you want to get to a place in your relationship with God where you're not tired of you. When you're not sick and tired of being the way you are and you need God to change you, you have to get alone with God because you're not going to be as honest as you need to be with God until you're alone with God. Matthew 6, 6 says, but when you pray, again, this is Jesus talking, when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. I mean, you can't. Jesus couldn't say it any more plain than that. He was teaching on prayer. He was teaching really on motives. He was talking about prayer. He was talking about fasting. He was talking about giving. And Matthew chapter 6, but he says, listen, when you pray, I need you to go away by yourself. There is a time for corporate prayer. There is a time for praying with others. There is, and it's good. 
but you have to go away by yourself, shut the door, and pray to your father in private. In our text, God didn't show up to have this wrestling match to change Jacob on the inside until he was alone. Mark 1, 35 says, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Even Jesus knew that he had to get alone with God. And I want to suggest to you, child of God, that if Jesus had to get alone with God, then me and you have to get alone with God. We have to get to a solitary place um, and so that we can pray. So Jesus is coming to you. God is coming to you. But you have to get alone. And the third thing is you're going to have to wrestle with God. So I'm still in verse 24. To verse 24 is, is action-packed. It says, this left Jacob all alone in the camp. He had to be alone. And then a man came, and then God came to him where he was. He met him where he was, and he wrestled with him until dawn began to break. Wrestling is full-body engagement. Have you ever seen a wrestling match? Like, when you think about it, when you think about a wrestling match in the way that the two people who are wrestling with each other are in a full body contact struggle. Like, I mean, they use their hands, they use their feet, they use their arms, they use their legs, they use their shoulders. They use every part of themselves to, to struggle and to win, to overpower the other one. And you think about a wrestling match, that's what it is. I'm using all of me to overpower all of you, everything. And so when I say that you have to wrestle with God, I love the way the Bible calls it a wrestling match because it helps us understand that this ain't going to be easy. Like, this is not going to be easy. You've been you for a long time. You've been the way you are for a long time. And God can, will, and desires to change you. He can, he will, and he desires to change me. But we're going to have to wrestle with God in order to do it. It's going to take all of us. I want to know if you are all in. Do you love him with all? Do you love him with all your heart? Do you love him with all your soul? Do you love him with all your mind? Do you love him with all your strength? That's what Jesus said in Mark 12, verses 29 to 31. He says, listen, when they were asking him, the Pharisees were asking him what the greatest commandment was. And he said, you God, love the Lord your God with all. And then he goes through a list to help us understand all means all. He says, love the Lord your God with all. All of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. And I am asking you. Are you tired enough of the me that you see? Are you all in in your relationship with God? Have you given him all? Have you surrendered all? Because it's going to take all in order to win this wrestling match that you're going to find yourself in with the Lord. Back to Hosea chapter 12, which I read in the very beginning. It says, in the womb he grasped at his brother's heel, and as a man he struggled with God. Listen to verse 4. He struggled with the angel and overcame him. He wept and begged for his favor. He begged for his favor. All of this was part of the wrestling match. And so it's going to take all of you. And it's going to be a, a you know, a fight or, you know, a wrestling match. There's just no other better way to say it. But also the fourth thing is it won't be a quick fix. You know, he wrestled with God all night. I'm still in verse 24. Then this left Jacob all alone. He was alone. And then God came to him. And then he wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. He wrestled, not just wrestled, but full body contact. You know, like all of, I can't even imagine. I, I've never been a wrestler. I've seen wrestling matches. But the way they struggle to overpower the other one, I can't imagine wrestling all night. But he, it, it won't be a quick fix. He wrestled all night. He wrestled until dawn began to break. Like, literally, the sun was coming up. And so can you imagine for a minute? I was trying to imagine. And I never wrestled, so I don't have, you know, a good analogy for it. But I've seen wrestling matches, and I can't imagine how exhausting it would be to try to wrestle all night to wrestle all night. How many of us would give up just on fatigue alone? I'd be like, look, I'm tired. You know, but 
It is a mindset that we're going to talk about, but I just need you to know it's not going to be a quick fix because, see, some of us, we pray for three days in a row and then we read four scriptures and we like this thing don't work because we don't see a change yet, but you haven't given it enough time. I want to suggest to you that the word works if you work it. The word works, but you got to wrestle all night. You got to stay with it. You got to, I don't care how tired you get. You got to stay with it and you got to stay in it. You know, the scripture that comes to mind is um, another well known passage of scripture in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. It says, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your native country and your relatives and your father's family and go into the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. I have heard so many lessons on it. You know, the sevenfold blessing and all that God um, promised Abraham. You know, the father of, of many nations and all that good stuff. But I just want to zero in on the beginning of verse 2. It says, the Lord said to Abram, verse 1 says, These your native country, your relatives, your family, your father's family, and go into all the land that I will show you. But what God says is, I will make you into a great nation. I will make you. When he says, I will make you, it denotes a process that must be had. Like, it's not going to happen overnight. You're not going to be a great nation tomorrow. I'm going to make you. And I want to suggest that the Lord is making you. He is making you over. In Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 to 6, God tells Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house because he's giving him a demonstrative sermon. And Jeremiah watches um, the potter um, molding clay on the potter's wheel. And the clay gets marred or messed up in the potter's hand. And so the Bible says that he saw the potter make the clay over again into another vessel. But he used the same clay, but he made it over. And I want to suggest that the Lord is making you, and the Lord will make you over again. When, you get, when we get more in his hand, he doesn't throw us out. He keeps us on the wheel, and he starts over, and he smooths out our rough edges until we are a vessel fit for the master's use. He makes us, though. It is a process. And that's why, child of God, you can't read, I'm happy, I'm so happy for you. If you are starting to pray consistently and you pray for three days in a row and you read your four scriptures or your four devotional lessons, I'm happy for you. But I need you not to be discouraged when you don't see a change yet because it is a process. This thing is not a quick fix. You know, and I'm not, listen, you in good company because there's a whole lot wrong with me. But I just need to tell you that there's a whole lot wrong with you. Like you got a whole lot wrong with you. God, it's a process. He's going to make you great. You're not going to be great tomorrow. He's going to make you great. Even the psalmist in Psalm 19, verses 12 to 14, the psalmist says, how can I even know all the sin lurking in my heart? Like, you know, he sounds almost discouraged. How can I know all the sin lurking in my heart? Lord, cleanse me of these hidden faults and keep me from deliberate sin. How do I know the, that verse? Because I pray it every day. You know, because I recognize that I can't even know all the sin lurking in my heart, child of God. I was born in sin. I was shaven in iniquity. There's none righteous. No, not one. There's so much wrong with me that, you know... Because the Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I can't even know all the sin lurking in my heart. And so there are things that are wrong with me that I don't even know is wrong with me. So just like the psalmist, I pray, how, Lord, how can I know all the sin lurking in my heart? So cleanse me. Cleanse me of these hidden faults. Cleanse me of the stuff that I don't even know is wrong with me. And then also keep me from deliberate sin. Don't let them control me because I want to be free of guilt and I want to be innocent of great sin. And then he goes on in verse 14 and says, Now let the words of my mouth in the meditation of my heart, let them both be acceptable in thy sight, 
Oh, Lord, you are my strength and my redeemer. But I need you to clean my heart. I need you to create in me a clean heart. I need you to renew a right spirit in me. Because if you don't clean my heart, then the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart are not going to be acceptable in your sight. So, Lord, I need you to do it. And I am just telling you, child of God, that it's not going to be a quick fix. It's just, you got to put in the work. You're going to have to wrestle. I want you to think about wrestling all night and how tired that's going to make you. Okay? That's, so that's number four. Number five is this going to hurt. You're like, Lord, it's getting better and better. But that's, listen, I'm just telling you the truth. It's going to hurt. Now we're in verse 25. It's going to hurt, but you have to stay the course. Verse 25, Genesis 32, 25 from our text tonight says, When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Yikes. Like, ugh, oh my goodness. He touched his hip, and he pulled it out of the socket. He wrenched it out of the socket when he saw that he wasn't going to win the match. And I am just saying that he hurt him. Like, it's going to hurt. Not hurt like getting punched in the eye, but hurt like post-op sur you know, surgery, your post-op recovery, the amount of pain you're in because you're healing. Pain is still pain. Like, I'm saying the guy's not going to punch you in the eye like it's not going to be pain for nothing. It's not for nothing, but pain is still pain. But you're going to have to stay the course. You're going to have to be, here's the thing. We will get to a place, all of us, me, you, all of us, we will get to the place where we are willing to endure the pain of change when we recognize, when we realize and understand that the pain of staying the same is greater. You know, it is about getting being sick and tired of being sick and tired. It is about being tired of the me that I see. When you get to a place, and, and that's the bottom line, is are you there yet? Are you to the place where you are so tired of the me that I see? You know, I know I can't say that, you know, like I'm not going to post it. I got to, when I, when I make my posts, when I post on Instagram, when I post on Facebook, I got to look like I got it all together and my life is perfect because that's how we do when we on social media. But the reality is, the reality is when I look in the mirror, when I think about my thoughts and I, the me that I see, when I get tired enough of dealing with the pain that it comes from being the me that I see, then I won't be afraid of enduring the pain of change because I will want change so bad. I want to be different so bad. I'm tired of this so bad. That's what Jacob was going on with Jacob when he wrestled with the Lord all night. He was afraid of Esau because of what he did to Esau. He was tired of the consequences. He was tired of paying the consequences of the life that he lived being the trickster he was. And he says, I don't want to be a trickster no more. I don't want to manipulate and deceive. I don't want to be a liar. I don't want people trying to kill me because of the way I treated them. I want you to make me different, God. And I'm not going to let you go until you make me different. So yes, it's going to hurt. I can't lie and say that it's not going to hurt, but you in pain now. You're hurt now. That's why you're tired of the me that you see because you're tired of the pain of being lazy. You're tired of the pain that is associated with procrastination. You're tired of the pain that's associated with whatever your it is. And I went through a long list earlier so I could get on your road. So I can meet you where you are so that you would know that, yes, I'm talking to you as well, child of God. Ecclesiastes 7.3 says, sorrow is better than laughter. This scripture has always taken me out. Ecclesiastes 7.3, sorrow is better than laughter, for sadness has a refining influence on us. I just think that's deep. You know, it's deep, um, and it's so true. I mean, it's Bible, but of course it's true. But it's, it's deep because it's true. Like, who would ever say that sorrow is better than laughter? Lord knows I don't rather be sad than laughter. Like, you know, it's counterintuitive to think that sorrow is better than laughter, but then the explanation comes after the comma. For sadness has a refining influence on us, and we are refined. And when you look back over your life, and you look back over some of the most painful experiences that you've had, whether life happened to you and you didn't do it, 
whether it was somebody else's fault and they did it and it caused you pain, or whether it is a direct consequence of something you did, it doesn't matter the origin of the pain. It doesn't matter the origin of the sorrow. I am saying when you think about how the scripture says that sorrow, sadness, has a refining influence on us, I want you to think about how much you have grown in that season. I want you to think about how if the Lord used that pain to refine you. And so, yes, part of this is pain. It's going to hurt, but it's going to be a good hurt. You'll be better for it because you'll be changed as a result of it. And the last thing is it's going to require relentless resolve. Relentless resolve. I mean, you're going to have to make up your mind. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to make up your mind. There's no way... Jacob could have wrestled with the Lord all night. You can't wrestle with nobody all night unless you have made up your mind. There comes a point where it stops being about the physical wrestling match and it becomes mental. It becomes, I am not going to let you go until you bless me. As a matter of fact, let me read um, Genesis 32 verses 26 to 31, the last portion of our text. It says, then the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. Can I just pause there for a minute? That's verse 26. The man, we know it's the angel of the Lord. He said, he wrestled with Jacob all night, right? And then he touched, when he saw that Jacob really was like, this, he really not going to let me go. Then he touched his hip, wrenched it out of its socket, right? And then he was like, he wasn't like, all right, you did good. You stayed the course. I'm going to bless you. That's not what the angel of the Lord said. The angel of the Lord said, let me go. He said, get off me. Let me go because the dawn is breaking and I, like, I need to go. But Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. I also think it's interesting in Hosea 12 that I read earlier that it says that he struggled with God, that he wrestled with God and won. And I think that's interesting because obviously Jacob is not stronger than God. But what that means is they had wrestled to the point where God is like, I'm going to have to kill him or bless him. Like, he's not going to let me go. And God could have killed him, but Jacob had made up his mind, I'm not staying like this. I'm going to do, Lord, you're going to have to do whatever it takes in me to change me. You're going to have to t you tell me what to do. I need to fast. I need to pray. I need to memorize scripture, whatever I need to do. But I'm not going to let you go. I have made up in my mind that I'm tired of living like this. You told me that I don't have to live like this. You told me that you've given me everything I need to live a godly life. You told me that I am a new creature in Christ. You told me that I can be different in you. You told me that if I abide in you and your word abides in me, that I can ask for whatever I want and you would do it for me. And I am saying I want to be like you. You said be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. You said be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. Well, I need you to hook me up. I need you to change me. And he was relentless. He had a relentless resolve. Jacob had made up his mind. And I want to say to you, child of God, that it's going to get to a place in your struggle. It's going to get into a place in your transition where you are growing and changing that the only thing that's going to make you stay the course as you are wrestling all night, when you're sick and tired, when you're tired, when you're fatigued, when your mental gives out, or when your physical gives out, it is going to be a resolve that you have that I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. You're going to bless me or you're going to kill me. You're going to change me or you're going to kill me. But Lord, you're not going, I'm not going to let you leave me like this. Um, the scripture that comes to mind is in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, when it says, you know, they were trying to give them, you know, the king's portion of food, all different kind of meats and stuff that they weren't supposed to eat because they were good Hebrew boys. And the Bible says that Daniel had purposed in his heart. One version says he had resolved himself that he was not going to eat that. He had made up his mind. And after he made up his mind, then God made a way for him not to have to eat that. He said, I'm not going to defile myself with the king's food. Give me fruit, give me vegetables, give me water, you know, whatever. I will sacrifice and I will eat less than I would have had if I was back in Jerusalem. But what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to defile myself and he purposed in his heart. And a made-up mind is everything. You have to make up in your mind that this is going to happen. You know, um, 
I, I, every every year, I don't know what's going on in these COVID streets now, but every year in the beginning of the school year when my students first come in, I make them watch a motiva a short, you know, it's like 10 or 12 minutes, I can't remember, a short motivational video, and it's Will Smith. And, you know, he has a lot of different videos, but this particular one that I show to all of my students um, is about work ethic, right? Because in the beginning of the school year, I'm trying to get them to start strong, tell them the, the importance of finishing strong, and Will Smith talks about his work ethic. And part of the reason I use Will Smith is because he's from Philadelphia, he wasn't born rich, he worked really hard, but one of the things that he also said in this video is he said that he doesn't feel like he is particularly gifted or particularly talented. He said, I just have a ridiculous work ethic. You know, and you know, that's what he says. So of course, that's what I want my students to hear. He says, I have a ridiculous work ethic. He said, listen, when, um, when the other guy is sleeping, I'm working. When the other guy is eating, I'm working. And what he was alluding to was even though he felt like he wasn't that necessarily that gifted or was not necessarily that talented, he attributed his success to his work ethic. But one of the things that he said, I bring that up, because one of the things that he also said in the video that I thought uh, was so powerful, um, and I actually, you know, say it frequently, is he says, I was, I'm willing to die on a treadmill. And then, so his interviewer will start laughing like, what? And he said, I'm willing to die on a treadmill. He says, so if me and you get on a treadmill, he said, either I'm going to die or you're going to get off first. He says, like, I'm not going to just stop. I'm not going to get off first. His mental was so strong, he had made up in his mind that he was not going to lose. He says, I'm not going to lose to the other guy. And so when I say I'm willing to die on a treadmill, what I'm saying is you're going to get off first because you're going to give up, or I'm going to die because my body's going to give out. But my body's going to give out before my mind gives out. And even though that's not a particularly uh, spiritual analogy, it's so appropriate here because that's how I need your mindset to be. I need you to get to the place if you're really tired. And I already know that this word ain't for everybody. I mean, y'all gonna be like, wow, that was good. Praise the Lord. But some of you aren't tired enough yet of the me that you see. But there are some of you. And I know that there are some of you because the Lord gave me this word for you that are tired of being the way you are. You are tired of pretending like you're good. You're tired of the facade. You are tired of the reality of who you are being different from who you present yourself to be. And you ready for God to change you. And what I am saying is he's coming to you and he will change you. But you have to get to the place like Jacob. You know what I mean? I'm willing to die on the treadmill. You touch my hip. I'm in pain, but I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. To me, that's the equivalent of dying on the treadmill. You are going to have to kill me or you're going to have to bless me. So the question becomes, how bad do you want it? God is showing up for your wrestling match. You don't have to say the same, but are you willing to do what it takes to be different? You Are you ready to wrestle with God and not let go until he blesses you are you ready to die on the treadmill and that's what the lord is saying to us tonight and so that's the word of god for tonight if you are listening if you are watching and you never remember a time in your life where you asked jesus to come into your heart and to save you today the bible says today is the day of salvation the bible says the day you hear my voice harden not your heart and so if you are uh, listening, if you are watching and you don't know, if you were to die today, God forbid, if you were to die today and you don't know if you would go to heaven or hell, you don't know where you would spend eternity, but you want to know and you want to be saved, I'm going to pray this prayer and I want you to pray it with me. The Bible says if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, we shall be saved. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's what we're going to do in this prayer. And so pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus is your son. And I believe that he died on the cross for my sins. I accept that I am a sinner. And I need a savior. Come into my heart and save me. Make me brand new. Make me like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you are saved once saved, always saved. 
God bless you. I am looking forward to seeing you next Wednesday um, at 630. Pray for me, and I will be praying for you. God bless you.